All right, it is seven o'clock. Call to order our regular meeting of the Beverly City Council, Tuesday, April 20th, 2021. Ms. Kent, could you please call the roll? Ames? Here. Copeland? Here. Feldman? Flaherty? Flowers? Here. Moran? Here. Houseman? Here. Rotunda? Here. And Guansi? I am here. Councilor Houseman, please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, thank you, Councilor Houseman. Now we will read our script. Script for remotely conducted city council meetings, Tuesday, April 20th, 2021. Confirming member access. As a preliminary matter, this is Paul Guansi, president of the Beverly City Council. Before beginning the meeting, I'd like to announce that this meeting is being recorded by the City of Beverly and live streamed by Bevcam on both Channel 99 and via Bevcam's YouTube channel. I'm confirming that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Quick thumbs up. Yes. Nod of the head. Great. Thank you, everyone. Introduction to remote meeting. Good evening. This open meeting of the Beverly City Council is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020. Due to the current state, continuing state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of COVID-19. In order to mitigate the transmission of the virus, we've been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings, and as such, the governor's order suspended the requirement of open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as adequate alternative public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting does not have public participation. We do not have any public hearings. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and televised live and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other participants or viewers may be able to see and hear you and anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. You have the option to turn off your video if you're participating via computer. All participants should keep their microphones or phones muted unless recognized by me, the chair, to reduce background noise and feedback. Please wait until the person speaking has finished before speaking so we can clearly hear all participants. In addition, because of the remote meeting, I'm going to read Rule 22 of the Rules and Regulations of the Beverly City Council. Rule 22. All subcommittees of the council shall cause records to be kept of their proceedings. They shall report by ordinance, order, or resolve unless otherwise provided by law. No subcommittee shall act by separate consultation and no report of the, as a body shall be received unless agreed in subcommittee actually notified and assembled for the purpose in hand and signed by a majority of the councils of the subcommittee. Every subcommittee to which any subject may be referred shall report thereon as soon of as possible after full consideration thereof and a vote thereon. However, if the council may by majority vote order any matter pending before the subcommittee to be acted upon, the subcommittee at its next meeting and or to be forthwith return to the full council. For those of you that are new to our meetings, what this means is we do not break for committee work and we vote on all orders on the floor um, as the committee of the whole. And that only, only happens if I get a majority vote of the council, which we've gotten all year, which is great. So I will ask Ms. Kent to call the roll on that. James? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Houseman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Yeah. Rotundo? Yes. And Guansi? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Kent. Um, I would entertain a motion to accept a late file resolution from Mayor. Mayor Kenya. Thank you. So moved. Second. 
I heard a second, so we'll take a roll call. Gaines? Yes. Coburn? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Houseman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guanci? Yes. I'm going to give Miss Kent a break, and I'll read this one because there's a lot of Italian names in it, and we know how she struggles with Italian names. No, that was just one of my jokes. Um, to the Honorable City Council, City Hall, Beverly, Mass. In regards to a resolution by the City of Beverly to renew a state authorized cultural district. Dear Honorable City Council, I respectfully submit the attached resolution for the City Council's consideration authorizing the city to submit an application to the Massachusetts Cultural Council to renew its state authorized cultural district named Beverly Arts District, which was originally created in 2015. As the City Council is aware, the city, in partnership with Montserrat College of Art and Beverly Main Streets, was awarded a grant in 2012 from the National Endowment for the Arts to create a master plan for the Beverly Arts District. The plan redefined cultural districts in part as an area that has a critical mass of institutions, venues, related retail activity, and creative individuals that interact in a way that supports the arts and creative endeavors. The Beverly Arts District was approved and created in 2015. Arts districts can encompass and in turn benefit a number of types of activities and land uses, are a useful tool in strengthening the cultural identity of downtowns, and play an important role in the urban revitalization and economic development strategy. Cultural districts are also characterized as walkable, compact areas that can easily be identified by residents and visitors alike. Designation through MCC is the only way in which Beverly Arts District will be recognized by the state. With this designation, the city and part of the exclusive list, oh, I'm sorry, with this designation, the city is part of the exclusive list of communities that support the arts in their community and will continue to help Beverly, uh, promote Beverly as a center for the arts and culture through the region, throughout the region. Since 2015, the Beverly Arts District designation Beverly Arts District designation has provided access to resources and technical assistance with state agencies and unlocked access to grant opportunities through MCC, supporting arts and culture programming and capital improvement. These grants have helped to fund staff to support the Beverly Arts District planning and operational consulting and the sidewalk poetry project, which will be implemented in the next few months. The city is also submitting a grant application for an artist in residence program for the current round. Over the last six years, the city has collaborated with Montserrat College of Art and Beverly Main Streets, as well as other cultural partners, including the Cap Theater and the Beverly Cultural Council. A site visit with MCC officials of the district was held in early March 2020, and extension subsequently granted for the renewal of applications. The renewal application must be submitted by April 30th, 2021. The city and its partners appreciate all the support the city council has previously provided in establishing and supporting the Beverly Cultural District and look forward to your continued support of the arts and cultural community in Beverly by supporting the attached resolution. Please find attached to this cover letter a map showing the extent of the proposed cultural district and identifying cultural assets and institutions. Feel free to contact Darlene Wynn, Planning Director, if you have any additional questions. Uh, so I will read the resolution and I'll ask for a motion to approve uh, questions and comments first. A resolution by the City of Beverly to renew a state authorized cultural district for at least five years named the Beverly Arts District, BAD for short. Whereas the city wishes to pursue a state authorized cultural district through the enabling legislation, Mass General Law, Chapter 10, Section 58A. Whereas the city is a mixed use geographical area that has a concentration of cultural facilities and assets. Whereas the city has adopted a resolution proclaiming its interest in establishing a state designated cultural district. Whereas the city has a broad and diverse partnership of stakeholders committed to cultural, the cultural community and economic development to provide oversight of the district. Whereas the Massachusetts Cultural Council will be petitioned in accordance with its guidelines and criteria to renew said cultural district. 
Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Beverly City Council that the city, Article 1, endorses the submission of this renewal application and agrees to foster the development of a cultural district. Article 2, endorse the state-sponsored cultural district goals, attracting artists and cultural enterprises, encouraging business and job development, establishing tourist destinations, preserving and reusing historic buildings, enhancing property values, and fostering local cultural development. Article 3, we will appoint a city official to represent the city within the district partnership of said cultural district. Article 4, encourages all who own property or businesses within said district to involve themselves and participate in the full development of the cultural district. In Article 5, directs city agencies to identify programs and services that could support and enhance the development of the cultural district and seek to make those programs and services accessible to the cultural district. And that is signed by the mayor and waiting for our signature and approval. Uh, any questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, I would enter to, oh, Darlene Wynn is here. Darlene Wynn. Hi, um, thank you. Director. Extraordinaire. Thank you, President Guansi. I just wanted to make a clarification since the application or since the letter was submitted, um, I've had further conversation with the Mass Cultural Council and um, we have a bit more time. Uh, we're still looking to get it done as soon as possible, but the um, April 30th deadline is not a hard and fast deadline. Um, August is more, they're trying to align them all to August now, um, but ours originally had been kind of an April deadline. And, and we're already, it was supposed to be done last year, but due to COVID and everything, just the MCC really didn't push it last year. So we're still working on it. And there's a couple other things that need to be worked out. Like uh, we need to resolve um, and revive the agreement, uh, an actual agreement, uh, management agreement between Main Streets and, and Montserrat and the city to which they have all already in writing um, and in conversation agreed to continue under the current agreement, but we need to put in effect a recently dated agreement. Um, so there's just a couple of things and I'm trying to line up um, some new partners because some of the partners that were involved in 2015 um, that were named in the application are no longer um, involved. Some of them names I didn't even know. Um, and I've been here since 2015. So I'm looking to put some of our mo more recent partners um, in the uh, application as uh, contributors to the district, so. Thank you, Ms. Wynn. Uh, Councilor Rams. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I just have a couple of questions. Um, on these articles one through five, could you just name a couple of the things specif specifically, Mrs. Wynn, that you plan to do to make them happy? It would make them happen rather. Sorry about that. <laughs> let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, I mean, some of this. I'm trying to think of, so we have a in 2019, we did a implementation plan, kind of a well, we called it bad 2.0. And I'm I'm looking at that as the framework for this next phase of our Beverly Arts District. Um, and it set forth some one year action items, which we've, we're kind of working our way still through and some other longer term action items. Um, and then we started meeting with some people as a result of that. Um, we also now have the master plan. So those that is the guide, that's the, the guiding document that I'm looking to. We also hired a consultant shortly after that to work with us to help establish what a, um, how we could uh, look at the organizational structure and staffing of the arts district. Um, and again, not to use COVID and pandemic as an excuse and our, and our consultant ended up getting ill herself. Um, and so that has just wrapped up, but we haven't been able to implement that necessarily. It's kind of a long-term, longer term strategy. Um, but one of the, um, so the, and I should say this resolution is largely the same as what was set forth in 2015, except for wordsmithed to be um, representative of today um, in that it was a renewal. Um, so, you know, the artist and cult, I mean, the artist in residency program is one that would kind of meet our article two. 
um, supporting Main Streets as managing entity of the Arts District and the programming that they currently do. Um, continued look at our public art policy and we've got some things in the work and some conversations that we've been having about uh, starting small to establish a public art policy that we can then grow and work on. Um, and um, Article four, you know, that would be kind of reaching out to new new businesses that come in to the district to try and engage them in the arts district um, and, and renew the interest. Um, and one of the other um, actually items that's coming down from the MCC is really to integrate the local cultural council in the arts district more. Right now, we, we, we're not competing, but at all, but we just don't, you know, there are various members that are certainly involved in the arts district, but we're looking to have a greater um, uh, integration between those two. So those are some of the ideas. So that, that's great. That's all good. I think that it, the time has long come for a public art policy. I think that um, anywhere I can help you out with that, I'd be thrilled to do. I think it's a really important um, step forward for the community and the culture in the community. Um, and I would assume maybe even some of the historic preservation planning and all that might tie into it. So I think this is this is great. And I always um, believe that Main Streets is really important for uh, supporting these types of endeavors and quality of life and culture here downtown. Um, and I had one more. Oh. Just curiously, have you appointed a city official who would specifically be tied to this project? Well, I think that would fall on the mayor to appoint. Um, we haven't, though, I don't know who was appointed necessarily before, but Aaron was listed on the agreement and language. So I'm assuming that I would be the appointed person, um, whether or not it's a formal appointment or not. I don't know how that worked last time. Um, but I expect, you know, I've been taking the lead on the arts and cultural initiatives and my colleague, Chelsea, who is the newest associate planner, has been helping me out on that. So. No, that's great. I was just curious if you already had somebody in place, but this sounds like a good yeah. initiative. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Councilor Rand. Council Flaherty has joined us. Let's go to uh, Councilor Rand, please. Thank you. I'm um, in full support of continuing to build our identity as a um, kind of a cultural hot spot on the North Shore and really support our artists. And I'm just wondering, it may have been buried, but I didn't see a map in, included with the late file. I might have just, maybe it came before or after, but so maybe. Um, no, as, as he read that, I was like, I don't know, because I sent a bunch of things to Martha and I was not expecting her to um, file it. Um, cause I was waiting for comments from, uh, solicitor Williams and, um, and then she filed and she had already filed it by the time I got back. So I, I think I didn't, I really didn't realize that that wasn't in there. So I can forward it. It hasn't changed. I know the conversation okay. we've had is talking about expanding the district. Um, but at this point we have not, uh, we have not crossed that bridge. Um, we figure that's there's still work exactly to do, even, what I was gonna, even with the renewal. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's exactly what I was going to ask about what the expanded area was. Um, and then, uh, so I'll keep my eye out for that map. And I'm wondering if you could just um, give me sort of a really brief overview of what the artists in residence grant requirements are. Like, what what are they expecting us to how do you, um, you know, the details of the grant that basically say, here's what your program will look like? So uh, the Mass Cultural Council grants are very fluid um, and don't require a lot of uh, information, which is great there. Um, but we've we've been working with um, both the Cultural Council or I've been working with the Cultural Council, the state Cultural Council agent and um, having some conversations both with Montserrat as well as um, a creative collective, a, a woman there who has worked extensively in Lynn and had some significant experience. So there's some other um, examples that we'll look to set, but basically we're applying to establish a program where we could have an artist in residence over the summer um, in 
a vacant storefront um, downtown. Uh, I've been talking with a certain parcel that possibly would be able to use, um, give it to us at no cost. Um, one of the other challenges that we're looking at is uh, identifying additional funding to support it. Um, because basically, you know, and I'm, I would, like I always do, look to Salem and Haverhill has a great program to help define what the, how the programs run and what the fee is. Um, we think, I do have, I do think we have a captive audience here. There's, you know, I, I know there was a number of applicants in Salem that in only one was selected. So, um, we see it as an opportunity both to focus on, um, on bringing an artist in to enliven downtown. Um, give people a reason to go downtown, but also provide education and provide a look back on the community, whether it deals with race or recovery or both or all, um, you know, inviting somebody to really tackle questions um, and reflect back on the community. I think that was going to be part of our call for artists. That's great. I like that theme. And my last um, comment, I guess, is just to um, Feel free to include me, as Councilor Ames said, in, in conversations about public art process and any of these other things to the extent that you think it would be helpful. Because our arts district, I believe, is entirely in War Two. Or no, it starts just, maybe it starts in War Three and then, um, yeah, winds up in War Two. Thanks. I will. Thank you both. Thank you, Councilor Rand. Uh, Councilor Copeland. Uh, yes, thank you, Council President, and uh, thank you, Ms. Wynn, as well. I just had a few questions. Um, just wanted to make sure, I think you stated this already, but is it funded uh, solely by grants at this point? Yeah, the <laughs> Beverly Arts District is, um, when it was originally established, there was a, a grant for new districts of $5,000 for staffing. Um, there is no that that is not continued. So Main Streets kind of absorbs the management of it um, without getting additional funding for that. Um, the city does contribute to Main Streets generally on an annual basis. Um, so, so yes, so the activities that we undertake uh, as an arts district, which sometimes you know, Main Streets tries to distinguish them separately and then the city does it does some things under the arts district as well, like the painting of the barriers last year, we kind of put that as our contribution to the arts district for the last year. Um, so yes, it's it's funding as it comes. Uh, the MCC community development grant that we've gotten the last three years um, is usually 5,000 this year it's 7,500. Um, so it's not a lot of money, um, but we find good ways to use it and we've also gotten some technical assistance from a Metro Area Planning Council to help with some of our organizational discussions and planning. But yes, it's and then the other part I should say is Main Street's um, programming and fundraising that they do the Bacon and Beer Fest, I think they used to do, um, Arts Fest, um, you know, and, and, no, and notably those activities have not happened. So um, you know, that's affected both Main Streets and the Arts District itself. Okay, thank you. And uh, also, um, I'd love to learn more about it, uh, especially I, I'm, I'm on the Task Force for Racial Equity for Be Beverly, and I'm, I'm the chair of the Economic Subcommittee. Uh, so especially Articles 2 and 5, I think there's a lot of overlap between what we're trying to accomplish there and the things that you are, are working on or might be trying to expand on there. Um, so. I think there might be synergy between between those two groups that we could uh, kind of work together on. Yep. So absolutely. I'd love to learn more on that. Great. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yep. Thanks. Thank you, Council Copeland. Council Houseman. Thank you, Council President. Um, yeah, uh, Ms. Wynn, um, absolutely you know, in support of, of this uh, resolution and, and progress on this. For some of the uh, the more recent counselors, Beverly, I introduced in the council past back in 2018 the Beverly Parts uh, Beverly Arts uh, policy, public art policy that is, uh, which in part led to um, the hiring of Lillian Sue, who is the consultant that uh, Ms. Wynn is referring to. I, I know that she's turned in a um, 
a draft report which really addresses some of the you know some of the the, the challenges the organizational pieces of how to structure uh, public art uh, programming in Beverly. Uh, can you uh, release that uh, draft uh, report so uh, we can take a look at uh, um, you know what's being framed on, and under discussion? Um, yes, I've been. It's been one of the things on my list of trying to work to share with the mayor. Um, I will admit I was not um, the the report was not what we hired her to do. Um, so it was a little bit of a challenge in that what we got was not what we had asked for. Um, and so I've been trying to reconcile that and um, make it more useful. What we were looking for was a job description and a, and a framework for an organizational structure. So, um, you know, I think she did make some changes that brought it um, more in compliance. Um, but I do, I've been trying to just it's one of the things on my list that is, has not been a high priority, unfortunately, but just to discuss with the mayor. But I would like, yes, I would like to get that out when I can. Okay. Is that something uh, that uh, you could uh, share with uh, share with me or any of the other counselors who are interested in taking a look at it? Uh, yeah, I think so. Great. I look forward to receiving it. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? I mean, this one, I know that the timeline has uh, been switched from April to August, but there's no harm in us approving this resolution tonight. No, I'd, I'd rather keep moving with the momentum that had been just recently, last week, put into place, but um, uh, but maybe not feeling quite as rushed. So, yeah. All right, so if nobody has any objections on moving on this, I would entertain a motion to wholeheartedly approve the resolution. So moved. Second. Second. And a roll call. Ms. Kennedy? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Houseman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Yeah. Rotundo? Yes. And Guanci. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Wynn, for um, being here to answer our questions and take our comments. And knowing that it looks like you will be the liaison to the Beverly uh, Cultural District, uh, uh, we'll We'll, we'll know where to go if we have questions. So just add that on your list of duties, correct? Yep. yep. Great. Thank you for everything. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, next up, we have Chief John Lasher. He's here to discuss the police department's use of force policy. Um, Councilor Ames is the one who originally wanted to uh, ask for Chief Lasher's presence. So I'll turn it over to Chief Lasher. Chief? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President, um, Council. So yeah, I was, I was asked to come on tonight. There have been some uh, recent changes because of the governor signing the new law into effect with police reform. Um, so the, the draft that we were working on or the policy we had put out a few months ago is, is somewhat changed because mass police accreditation has changed the policy in mass, to meet mass general law. And it doesn't change anything we do, it just puts everything in, in um, more defined language within the policy. So all the all the stipulations that were part of police reform are now in the policy. Um, you know, right to uh, duty to intervene, uh, which which we we train anyway. Uh, de escalation, which we train anyway. Um, the use of choke holes has never been used in the Commonwealth. It's never been trained in the Commonwealth, but it's in the policy. So those are the things that uh, are in the the policy. Again, it's a 29 page document. It covers uh, quite a bit of of uh, a policy that's written mostly by a U.S. Supreme Court decisions and mass general law. So there's, there's not a lot of movement with the policy because it's set by uh, statute, whether it's federal or state, uh, state Supreme Court, federal Supreme Court, and best practice throughout the country. The, the policy is based on, as I said, it's the mass accreditation policy, but it's also based on the national CALEA policy, which is a, a, na a nationwide national accreditation. It's a highest standard for accreditation. Uh, within the United States for police agencies. I think right now in the Commonwealth, there's only maybe one or two police agencies that are actually accredited through CALEA, but it's the same uh, standards that we use for mass accreditation is used in the um, the mass accreditation policy that made on the CALEA, the CALEA standards. So a lot of things that are signed into law um, in, in January of this year go into effect, some go into effect 
July 1st of this year, some go into effect September of this year, some go into effect in December of uh, this year, and then so, so on over the next three years. Uh, a lot of changes have come down, you know, with uh, use of reserve offices. Uh, there are no more reserve academies. So what's going to happen is after we go through all of our current reserves, um, we are not going to be able to hire part-time offices anymore. We'll only be able to hire full-time offices, which will certainly affect the budget. Um, this is going to affect a lot of places that can no longer use part-time offices. Budgets are going to be thrown all, thrown all out of kilter because you're going to only be able to use full-time offices. Uh, questions come up about the animal control office and harbor masters. They possibly will all have to be full-time certified to, to be special offices with the Commonwealth, which means more extensive training, uh, higher salaries, more full-time offices. So again, this the bill is going to affect budgets uh, in the future. Um, I can certainly speak directly to any of the, the highlights of the policy. If there are any questions, uh, but basically it's the same policy that we've talked about uh, earlier. And um, there's some final final um, final looks that we're having with the mayor and the city uh, the um, city solicitor and the unions. Uh, it's all again, it's all in effect. They're aware it's in effect. Where it's mass general law, but my plan is is um, to have a training. Uh, in the very near future, prior to the end of this fiscal year, with, with some monies um, still we have in our budget, to have every police officer trained in numerous policies that changed because of uh, implementation of uh, police reform. There's a little bit of a change in the internal affairs policy. There's a change in some documentation. There's a change in um, um, anti-bias policing. Some things like that have also changed because of this policy. So. The best way to do it so that everybody is on the same page is to have a probably a four hour trainer for every single officer to go over every policy. One thing we've been working at um, is certification and actually accreditation through the Massachusetts Accreditation Council. Uh, we're, we're in what's called self-assessment right now um, and we're working towards accreditation. One of the things we can, we can never get was certification because of the uh, deplorable conditions of the police station. The building fails all the states requirements for police departments. So now that we're moving in a new building, we've already, the architects have already submitted a, a, the plans to the uh, Police Accreditation Commission. They've already approved our cell block and other parts of the station, juvenile holding facilities, things to that effect. They've already been approved by the Commonwealth Department of Public Health. It does a lot of that. Uh, so we're way ahead of the game on that. And by implementing and training with the new policies, uh, we should be able to get certification uh, hopefully by the end of this year, if not early into 22, and then probably uh, in the latter year of 22, become an accredited agency within the Commonwealth. So I'm certainly I'm certainly able to answer any very specific questions, not very, but any specific questions or questions you may have. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Councilor Rotundo. Thank you, Mr. President. Chief, um, some of the meetings that we've been having, public safety with the uh, subcommittees, is this information that you'll be coming forward with the um, Committee of the Whole um, with the diversity inclusion. Um, it's just information that's been kind of asked by a lot of the people. I know we've talked about it in the subcommittees, but eventually that will be coming out to the uh, larger group. Yeah, so actually our plan is again, once we, we, we terribly need to update our website also, we, we have a hard time down, uh, loading documents onto it. Uh, there's a couple of things that we're hoping to do. One is to load a lot of these policies onto our website so anybody can just access them. Um, some, some policies have some parts of them that we do not put out to the public because there are lots of safety issues, the way we may do certain things. But a lot of them are, are open to the general public, and we'll put those policies on the website. Uh, the other thing that a lot of police agencies do also is they uh, will allow the reporting of certain uh, crimes directly through their website. In other words, vandals to a mailbox or, or you know, things like that can be reported via the computer and can be verified. And that way, uh, an officer doesn't have to spend time and people don't have to come into the station and do certain reporting. Lynn does it now, a lot of other departments. So again, in the future with an update of the website, we hope to be able to do some of those things as well. But um, most policies that we have is, is really about 83 accreditation policies um, that, are, that are out there. We're, we're gonna, probably get a vast majority on the website as soon as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Ames. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. I, I thought it was important just that 
you come before us and talk about the changes and and um, we because I think it's important information for the community out there to know and understand. Um, so you're saying that there were changes with de-escalation. Um, a lot of the police reform bill changes are into this um, policy. There'll be increased uh, training, anti-bias training. Um, do you believe that just the, how do you believe, what do you think this will be for the impact for both your team and the people who live here in the city? Uh, minimal, because these are the things we've always done and we've, the way we've always trained. It's now just being put in writing. There's really no change in policy. There's really no change in the way we train, the, the, the change we do uh, business every day. It's, but there, again, it's, it's being memorialized in policy now, which again, the whole idea behind accreditation is so that every officer knows exactly um, what they're doing, what, what every officer and every other community is doing. So right now I have an officer in Boston, um, you know, standing by with Boston Police Department. They've requested assistance in NEMLA, we're part of NEMLA. My offices have jurisdiction, every single city and town in Middlesex and Essex County because of mutual aid agreements with NEMLA. So if we respond to any of those jurisdictions, uh, our offices have, juris have police powers in any of those jurisdictions. So that's why it's extremely important that we're all on the same page with policies. My policy is the same policy that Lowell has. My policy is the same policy that Lawrence or Lynn or, or Boston has. Um, so it's that that really, again, it's best practices. And that's the most important part about it. That, that's really helpful. And I think one would think that to have uh, similar policies across the board would would um, you'd end up with, you know, just a more even result, if nothing else. And I just have a question. So if um, someone, if one of your team were not to follow a policy or if there were an incident, what is generally the ramification for this? Just so that I can understand. Well, again, it depends on what the, the issue was. Um, there, any, any violation of policy becomes, uh, could become an investigation. It could be a simple training issue. You know, why was something done? Was, uh, you know, part of, part of the use of a taser is to spark test it every day. The reason you spark test it is because a memory can be built up in the taser. So you take, you take off the cartridge and the spark test, and it keeps the battery fresh. So it's part of it to do that. If an officer didn't spark test it and malfunction, that could be a training issue. Um, you know, maybe not as a serious violation, but a training issue. If something came up that we felt was a, a serious violation that could lead towards a letter of warning, uh, suspension, or, or you know, termination, then we're going to the internal affairs policy or an internal affairs investigation is done. And then based on what the issue is, discipline or no discipline is based on the outcome of the investigation and based on the, the specifics of the incident. Thank you very much. And thanks again for being here. And I, um, I think also getting the policies up on the website and having that sort of transparency where you can is definitely as a community, I think, where we want to go. And I applaud your efforts on in that behalf. Yeah, we've been, we've been trying to work with some of the colleges and trying to find someone with some IT uh, capabilities because the city's buried right now. With, the city's doing a tremendous job in, in changing a lot of its IT structures and, and up, upgrading everything. So it's tough for them to sit down and help build a website. But we're, we're going to work on um, someone either being dedicated to, we may have to look for um, some type of grant money if it's available, as so I'm looking at our grants director, um, and put some, put some real effort into updating our policy. Our, our, our web page, yes. Thank you, Councilor Ames. Councilor Flowers. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, Chief, I'll, I'll echo the thanks for being here and for talking with us about the use of force policy. Um, I wonder if you could just help clarify for me, I, I may have missed this in the just the process that you're following. I know you had opened up for community comment this process of reviewing our use of force policy, which I think was a really important uh, step for our community and appreciated. W have I missed it or will you be then sharing um, any edits to the policy that might also incorporate any 
community comment? I know you're talking about changes due to mass law. Yeah, no, and that, 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 I'll say effort was kind of misguided. We put the policy out there so people could see it, but this is based on Supreme Court decisions. It's based on whether the state Supreme Court or federal Supreme Court decisions based on um, laws written, in, you know, by lawyers and, and, um, and the policies are written by police experts. So, you know, taking comments from the public about changing it, again, what that does is it then changes best practices. So if we change a policy in Beverly because the citizen wants to put one word in it, does it make it invalid then if, if a Salem office is now in Beverly and something happens, are they covered by our policy? So we, we have to keep the standard policy set by the Mass Accreditation Bureau. But the idea of putting the policy out to the general public so they can see and understand it is extremely important. Thank you. That's a, that's a helpful point of clarification, um, and I appreciate that. I wonder, um, and maybe you and I can even talk more about this at another time. I, I'm curious, based on what you're saying, um, I feel like some of the feedback it seemed, or so, uh, uh, the public feedback was around just language that we use in section five on our policy, which is about vulnerable populations. Um, and you, I'm sure you also got this feedback. I had heard from some folks who work with some of these vulnerable populations that some of our language is just outdated. So the policy itself is not necessarily the problem, but maybe some of our language around areas of mental illness um, and, and different disabilities might be outdated. Is that something that you would consider undertaking uh, a change on to catch our language up? Is that, that's a little different than policy change, I understand that. No, I, and I, no, I understand, again, I guess, you know, talking semantics, we're saying the same thing, but using different different words, and is it, just, is it possibly that that could, that could happen? And what I would do is I would take any suggestions like that and uh, send them to the Massachusetts Accreditation Board to make sure that we're not then stepping outside of what they would accept as the, uh, the policy. Because what will happen eventually when we, we go to be certified, uh, uh, a group of individuals come in and actually go through all your policies and ask officers questions and make sure that the policies are up to the mass standard. So if we change something significantly, it could jeopardize us becoming a cre uh, certified or accredited. Thank you. And may I ask one more question? Is that okay? Of course. Thank you. Um, Chief, the other question I had was, I know our, our policy, and you just uh, alluded to it as well in answering Councillor Ames, um, has sort of internal affairs and a process for working through if there was a violation of our policy. Um, do you foresee a time when there might be, in addition to that internal process, a way to, and I, I think in, in a sense, Beverly has sort of the um, underpinnings maybe to add this with our community action committee the, um, that you have with folks, Citizen Action Committee. Do you foresee a time when you might find it beneficial too to have a, like a citizen um, oversight committee to work in conjunction with with um, with your internal process in just to open up some of that transparency for the community? Is that something that you think might be on the horizon, might be a possibility for our community at any time? I mean, you're really not seeing that in any cities or towns in the Commonwealth, especially with the change in police reform. You now basically have pretty much a civilian oversight committee in, in, um, in post commission. The post, the post commission, and I wish I could remember the number, but I think there's 19 members, only two or three police officers. Most of them are, are appointees by the governor or by different agencies. Um, and that's, that's the, the um, a second appeal uh, process available. So if, if say anything, anything that we do where we issue discipline, I have to notify the, the civil service bureau because we're a civil service department. And um, at some point, I believe by December of this year, like I said, all of our files have to go to the post commission. So there is there is a, a there's multiple oversights um, in place right now. It's something I don't see. I mean, I, I can't tell you what's going to happen in the future, but it's something I don't see right now. Thank you, but that's a helpful reminder that there is this at the state level as well. Thank you very much, Chief. I appreciate it. Thank you, Council Flowers, Council Houseman. Uh, yes, good evening, Chief, uh, and I just want to echo my, my colleagues' um, comments about thanking you uh, for coming this evening and, and helping us understand uh, understand this territory. Um, I, my questions are kind of all over the place here, uh, but I have four of them. I'll, I'll try to be focused on it. One is I'm, I'm uh, I guess, surprised that built into the 
police budget is not specific money for building a you know a, a website that communicates to the public in the way you want to so i'm not sure if this is a question for um for you or Ms. Barrett, but uh, what are the prospects for getting, uh, you know, fundings uh, for, uh, you know, for some website development? Um, if it's not directly inside your budget, what are the prospects for getting grant funding for that? I mean, I'll let Mrs. Barrett answer also, but uh, we're always looking for grant opportunities. We are looking at especially tech, uh, technology grants all the time. Um, and we'll continue to do so. And, and right now, I think there's, there's usually more um, technology grants available and say equipment grants and things to that effect. Um, I did hear something that the federal government's going to be releasing some um, cops money like you know, that were back in the 80s, back in the uh, 80s and 90s. Um, so there'll be more money for, for policing and training and, and specialized things like that. So again, and I'll, and I'll let her answer too, but one of the other things that we're, we're really um, you know, excited to get in, in uh, operation will be our training simulator at the new station. Um, you know, we're going to have a, a state-of-the-art training simulator, which will be used for de-escalation training, use of force training, um, and a bunch of, you know, other uh, aspects of, of uh, that side of the business. So that will give us the ability to train 24 hours a day, seven days a week, doesn't matter what the weather is, as long as there's an instructor that can run the computer. Uh, something, again, that we don't have now. That's going to be tremendously important. And and I think it's going to be important for the councils once that's operational to get up there and see how it works and see how use of force is actually done in the field, see how de-escalation is actually done. Um, it's going to be a tremendous tool. Um, I can I can add in on that. This is Catherine Barrett, the Director of Grants. Um, there are uh, technology grants that the state offers, and we've taken advantage of those for uh, several years now. We typically get the grants for more citywide technology projects, but we certainly could look at uh, website upgrades for both fire, police, and parks and rec. They all sort of have their own separate uh, websites. And I, uh, the fire and police uh, websites are, are good. I think they could use a refresh and some more functionality and be a little bit more uh, user-friendly and easier to navigate. So we certainly could look at a grant for um, uh, I would say our emergency responder departments like police and fire uh, to, to upgrade those websites. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Ms. Barrett. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, so much of, of, of municipal government's job is communication to the public and with the public. And so the transparency, I mean, it's, it's frustrating to hear that, you know, the chief may have a hard time getting a document up or Mr. Mr. Ailes, you know, getting a document up to the website. So I know that on the city side, you know, uh, you know, we've gotten the executive branch website redone. Uh, I, I think it's it'll be great when we can get that across the board to our various different uh, uh, departments, especially the first responders. Um, Chief, um, I just want to follow up on, on uh, a, a part of the, the, the back and forth between you and Councillor Flowers, where you talked about policy versus language, just to help me clarify my understanding. So if Massachusetts has a policy and it's best practice and you want consistency among municipalities in following that policy, does it, I, I guess when I, when I initially heard that, I was thinking that the wording of that policy would basically be not maybe boilerplate, but would be basically lifted, cut and paste, if you will, uh, so that all municipalities would have the same wording. But then I also heard you say that the, you know, so that, that what's in Lowell and Salem and Beverly and Boston are all the same. But at the same time, you said, well, if we tweak our language a little bit, it may be consistent with the policy, but it might not be the same as what's in other communities. There might be some concern about some inconsistencies. Can you speak to, a little bit to, to the distinction between a policy adoption and language which expresses that that uh, policy? Yeah, I know. And, and again, I I know you're more versed in, in a lot of this because you are a lawyer, but you know the title, and, and uh, I'll read it off the, the, the form, is dealing with minors under 18, mostly disturbed persons or physically disabled individuals. And some of the, some of the language in the policy um, is, is basically, as you know, is written by lawyers or, or, or it's legal terminology. Um, and so 
you know, there, there may some, be some words that people say, well, in 2021, we don't use that word anymore. Um, if there's another word that means the same thing that's more current, you know, I mean, we've literally gone through every part. I've been, I've been doing this, I hate to say it, but between full-time and part-time now for 40 years. And everything's changed in 40 years. So whenever we rewrite a policy now, it's, it's, you know, it's non-gender. He, she, them, they, it, we don't, you know, everything has to be changed. Um, you know, Tennessee versus Gardner, which is one of the major Supreme Court decisions. When I started in 1981 in, in um, law enforcement, you know, you could, you could actually shoot a fleeing felon. Um, and then that, that federal U.S. Supreme Court decision changed that, where they had to be, you know, using a weapon to escape. You had to feel that the person was going to create um, further harm to individuals. So there was a lot of, there's always constant changes with the law and, and with um, the way things are conducted and worrying. So again, I think we have to look at some of it. And if it can be, it may be suggestions that um, some of the chiefs can make to the Mass Accreditation Bureau. Um, I have a seminar coming up next month with all the mass major city chiefs. Um, you know, this is, we have a, um, a presentation being put on by some of our clinicians, um, like our, our jail diversion clinician, Lawrence jail diversion clinicians are going to be in there, boss, uh, Chelsea. So we're all going to sit down and talk and maybe look at some of this and say, no, maybe this needs to be revisited on how, how the wording is, but not the outcome of the policy. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, thank you, Chief. Uh, so uh, my last two questions are related. Um, uh, uh, and one of them may be out, outside of your wheelhouse. How can, when you describe best practices and sort of the statewide uniformity within Massachusetts, that at least is the goal, how similar is that to other states around the country, or maybe just, you know, New Hampshire, which is your, you know, where you more recently served for a, for a long period of time? And then uh, I'll, I'll ask both questions at the same time. The other is one thing we've heard as Massachusetts residents is that at least in other states, if an officer is terminated for, uh, for disciplinary reasons and uh, would never be hired again by say Beverly's police department, in other states we've heard, well, that officer can go somewhere else and get hired by another police department without that department knowing that the, you know, the, the history or the, the fact that there was disciplinary action or, or termination for cause. So they're kind of related, uh, but in, in particular for Massachusetts, can that happen in Massachusetts? Or is there a system by which if someone is terminated for cause in Massachusetts, as an officer, they can't go to another, uh, you know, another jurisdiction without that jurisdiction being in, you know, having available to them the history. I mean, I'll say theor theor theoretically, prior to police reform, I guess it was it would have been possible. But now with police reform, there is a certification pro process, um, so that every police officer has to be certified, basically licensed. So I came from New Hampshire. What again? New Hampshire has a, a, a post is a post state, so that even if the police department uh, didn't take someone's certification say for an incident that occurred and, and the police department didn't act on it, the state can actually suspend your, your um, police powers. So now Massachusetts is, gonna, is doing that as well. So if there's a related issue where I come up in worst case scenario, I had to place somebody on say administrative leave, I report that to the post commission, they would also suspend the, the, the police um, powers of that individual until either it was cleared or, or, or finalized in one way or another. Um, Again, this is one thing that goes back. When I, when I started down here almost eight years ago, um, this came up a few times. And so I know four to five years ago, I was approached. Um, the Chiefs of Police have been trying to get a post certification in the Commonwealth for at least five years. We've been pushing and pushing and pushing, and the legislature, legislature wouldn't even listen to us. They wanted nothing to do with it. And then when police reform came, it, it, they brought the idea and bang a pass like that. So we're grateful it passed. The chiefs wanted a certification process. Um, it, it was unfortunate it took police reform to put it in. We wanted it years ago. Um, and it's, it's now part of the way we do it. One thing I th think is coming up on the federal level, kind of what you're speaking to also, is a national registry. Um, I think that eventually there'll be a national registry. I think there's 850,000 police officers in the United States. And I think that eventually you'll see uh, that type of things where you're a certified police officer, you're in a national registry, if you were suspended or terminated, you, you do that. 
But I mean, I know for, for myself as the appointing authority, we do thorough backgrounds in everybody we hire. And I would never hire anybody that was terminated by another agency. But so just to summarize, in Massachusetts, the system is set up so that at least in theory, one officer could not travel from one jurisdiction to another if they had, uh, you know, if you will, a black mark on, on, on their record. That other, the, the new police department would, would, uh, would know in the, th learn through the hiring process that the past of that officer, or maybe even find out that they weren't even certified. Is that a reasonably accurate way Correct. of saying it? Okay. And that, again, that's one thing that's now coming up where they're, they're uh, um, you know, working reserve offices way out west that 30 years ago, they walked into the chief's office and the chief handed them a badge and said, you're now a reserve officer and they've been a reserve officer for 30 years. And they've never gone to even a part-time academy. When I was a, a special police officer, it's called an SSPO, a special a special state police officer, back in 1981 at Lowell General Hospital. I I got a brown book. It's called the Brown Book Test for part-time certification. And he became a reserve police officer. So it just shows you how things have changed uh, and, and constantly evolving. Thank you very much, Chief. These are uh, really valuable, uh, useful conversations. Thank you for coming this evening. Thank you, Councilor Hausman. Councilor Copeland. Yes, thank you, Council President, and uh, thank you, Chief. Uh, I know this has been a process <laughs> that you've been working on for a while, and I'm uh, glad to see it brought to this to this point. Uh, my question was, as far as um, you talked about putting it on a website, but maybe through the you know Human Rights Committee or some other city organization, uh, is there a way for us to have a community-wide conversation in, in regards to these changes and what's happening? Because I know this has been a lightning rod issue for the community. Uh, so it would be good to have some time in there. Yes, absolutely. Um, Mr. Tolkien and I have had this discussion with the, the equity uh, committee that we're on with criminal justice. And we've actually had a meeting last week and talked about doing some um, citywide conversations. That, that's actually in the planning right now. Okay. And uh, another thing, I don't know how big of an issue this was here in Massachusetts, but as far as the new regulations, um, like Councillor Hausman was saying, if you have someone that has, uh, you know, mark against them where they have a, a less than desirable record, um, is there a way for, say, in your department, if you were running into someone that you felt just wasn't right for the position and had all these marks against them, is there a process for being able to move that person on out of the role? Yes. Yeah, so what happens is right now, again, we're a civil service community. So if, if we are going to hire police officers, we hire them off of the the current civil service list. We do a, um, a thorough background investigation. We do an oral board. Um, and then um, if, if they're hired, they go through extensive field training. And again, this things are now changed because there's now no more part-time academy. So what will happen is if we hire people in the future, we'll have to wait for a full-time academy opening to occur. Once they've graduated the academy, there's still a one-year probation that they go through and they can be, they can be terminated or, or released um, you know, based on the inability to train. Um, but again, we do very thorough background investigations and there's been some problems. We've never had a problem, but there's been some problems. I, I get a monthly report from Mass Civil Service and there are a lot of times when police departments uh, pass on someone based on a horrific motor vehicle record or some minor criminal uh, indiscretions and things like that and civil service will override them and make you hire that person. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that we have to work on um, with a lot of different agencies. Yeah, and and also to clarify it a little bit more as well, if there's, for instance, if someone that you've already hired that's been a part of your, your specific police force and say they have, you know, five or 10 uh, complaints against them, you know, depending on the nature of those complaints, is there a process that you can deal with that or be able to say, okay, this person needs not to be a part of this anymore? Yeah, everything is based on progressive discipline. Uh, again, if it's if it's multiple minor issues, um, you, you work up to, again, letter of warning, suspension. Uh, so anytime I suspend anybody over five days, I have to conduct a hearing. Um, and, and then um, if it's a multiple, you know, after that, it turns into multiple, multiple month suspensions, which they can still appeal to civil service. And then at some point, they get what's called a last chance letter. And if at the end of that, they continue to um, some type of inappropriate uh, actions or can't follow policy or, you know, whatever the case may be, they could work themselves up to being dismissed. 
Um, but on the backside of that, you could have an incident that it's it, it, a one single incident that's so fair enough that would that would reckon you know, would lead to its termination. Okay, all right, that, that's perfect. It makes sense because I think. One of the major issues we're seeing in other parts of the country, but it didn't seem like they had that process. So someone could have multiple you know, severe complaints, but still stay in that role, or whether it was due to the union or otherwise. Um, so I think in the community conversations, that'll probably be a, a big point of uh, conversation as well. So uh, thank you, Chief. I appreciate the answers. And uh, thank you, Council President. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Council, thank you, Council Copeland. Uh, does anybody have anything else? Chief, great information. We really appreciate you being here. Great questions. Um, if there's ever anything you need to update us with again, uh, you know you're always welcome before us. Thank you, Chief. No, thank you, Mr. President and Council. And again, uh, you know, I have, like I've always say I have the uh, ability to come in front of the Council and speak, but I'm just representing the men and women of the department do a tremendous job. And thank, thank you, and I always want to thank them. Thank you, Chief. Uh, let's go to, uh, I would entertain a motion to accept the minutes of our meeting, which is held on April 5th, 2021. Second. And a roll call, Ms. Kent? Haynes? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Houseman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guanci? Yes, uh, communications from His Honor the Mayor. I would entertain a motion to accept uh, four late files from Mayor Cahill dealing with appointments. It's order number 85, 86, 87, and 88. So moved. Second. Second. In a roll call? Ames? Yeah. Copeland? Uh, yes. Clarity? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Houseman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guansi? Yes, so those late files have been approved. So Ms. Kent, could you go through them? Order number 85, dear Honorable City Council, I hereby reappoint subject to your review. It's provided in section 2-10 and section 3-3 of the Beverly City Charter, Pauline Texera, to serve as Human Resource Director for a period of three years. Her term is to be effective from February 17, 2021 until February 17, 2024. Sincerely yours, Michael P. Cahill, Mayor. Please refer to the Committee on Public Services. Order number 86, dear Audible City Council, I hereby reappoint subject to your review as provided in section 2-10 and section 3-3 of the Beverly City Charter, Steve Fredrickson to serve as Director of Municipal Inspection Building Commissioner for a period of three years. Sincerely yours, Michael P. Cahill, Mayor. Please refer to the Committee on Public Services. Order number 87, dear Ottawa City Council, I hereby reappoint subject to your review as provided in section 2-10 and section 3-3 of the Beverly City Charter. Michael Collins to serve as Beverly's Director of Engineering, Commissioner of Public Services and Public Works for a period of three years. Sincerely yours, Michael P. Cahill, Mayor. Please refer to the Committee on Public Services. Order number 88. Dear Honorable City Council, I hereby reappoint subject to your review is provided in section 2-10 and section 3-3 of the Beverly City Charter. Bruce, Bruce Doig to serve as Beverly's Director of Parks, Recreation and Community Services for a period of three years. Sincerely yours, Michael P. K. Hill, Mayor. And please refer that to the Committee on Public Services. Uh, I would entertain a motion to accept the late file on order number 89. So moved. Second. Roll call. Ains? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Houseman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guansi? Yes. Ms. Kent. Order number 89, dear Audible City Council, I am pleased to inform you that the City of Beverly has been awarded a $19,986 Fiscal Year 21 Firefighter Safety Equipment Grant from the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to purchase structural turnout gear and tools for the Beverly Fire Department. Mass General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53A requires both city councilor and mayor approval before any grant, earmark, donation, or gift to the city can be extended for their prescribed purpose. I therefore request the city council approve this grant at your upcoming meeting. Sincerely yours, Michael P. Cahill, Mayor. Um. Our uh, Queen of Grants is here, Ms. Catherine Barrett. Ms. Barrett, comments on this one? 
Thank you, Council President. Um, I see that our Fire Chief Peter O'Connor is with us. I'm going to pass this to him, but I just wanted to say, I think he's been chief for about four months now, and he's been doing at least a grant a month, and he actually wrote this grant. So congratulations, and I'll let him take it from here. Chief O'Connor. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Catherine. I appreciate the, the uh, kind words. Um, no, this is this is a great opportunity for us. That uh, like just under twenty thousand dollars, the lion's share of it is going to go to uh, personal protective equipment. Um, everybody's going to get a new hood. The hood, uh, you know, we, we try to replace them every year. It keeps toxins away from you. Uh, we wash the stuff. It gets beat up pretty good. Um, and we're going to get three new sets of turnout gear for three of our newer firefighters so that they'll have a second set of gear. Uh, really important for everybody to have a second set of gear. Um, Chief Carter, the mayor, they've been great about making sure we're in that position. Uh, so everybody, just about everybody has a second set of gear right now. We'll have four more that I'm hoping to do right after this. And then it's just going to be cycling through some aging gear after that. So a good opportunity to get us a head start on that. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Barrett or Chief O'Connor? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to approve and accept the grant. So moved. So moved. Second. And a roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Houseman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guansi? Yes, uh, I would entertain a motion to accept the late file on order number 90. So moved. Second. 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 And a roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Austin? Yes. Raymond? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guancy? Yes. Ms. Kent? Order number 90, dear Honorable City Council, I am pleased to inform you that the City of Beverly has been awarded a $72,000 grant from the Mass DOT. This grant funding will be used to support a cold storage structure project at the Beverly Regional Airport. The match for this grant will require a transfer from the Airport Enterprise Fund balance in the amount of $18,000. This transfer request will necess necessitate a public hearing prior to any final action by the City Council. Mass General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53A, requires both City Council and Mayor approval before any earmark, grant, donation, or gift to the City can be expended for their prescribed purpose. I therefore request the City Council approve this grant at your upcoming meeting. Sincerely yours, Michael P. Cahill, Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Kent. I noticed that Airport Director uh, Gloria Bullion is here. So, Ms. Barrett, would you like to address this? I know there's two things we need uh to do. Yes, Council President. I don't see Gloria Bullion in the meeting. Do you see her here? I do not. Oh, okay. Uh, she actually couldn't make it this evening. She had an educational commitment. Um, but this grant is from Mass DOT Aeronautics, and typically those grants do require a 20% match, which in this case is $18,000. The cold storage project is needed because uh, the airport is completely out of space for storage for equipment. And this uh, project will uh, provide a location for all the maintenance equipment to be out of the weather and the elements. And so it will be really helpful. Uh, airport maintenance and operations will be using it. Uh, and the project will be completed by June 30th of 2021. Uh, any questions for Ms. Barrett? Okay, so what I will do, uh, we have to, Ms. Kent, we have to set a public hearing for this. We're going to, I would entertain a motion to approve the grant and set a public hearing for May 5th is our meeting, first May meeting. 3rd. May 3rd. May 3rd. 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 So I would entertain a motion to approve the grant and accept the grant and set a public hearing for um, Monday, May 3rd at 7.15. So moved. Second. In a roll call? Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Husband? Yes. Rand? Yes. Yeah. Rotundo? Yes. And Guansi? Yes. And thank you, Ms. Barrett, for being here tonight and uh, keep up the good work. 
Thank you. Uh, we have no communications from other city offices and boards, so we'll go to yeah. communications, applications, and oops, I'm sorry. We Ms. do. Good. We have the late file. From oh, the late file. I'm sorry, you're right. I had the wrong agenda in my hand. I would entertain a motion to accept the late file on order number 91. It's from uh, Darlene Wynn and the Parking and Traffic Commission. So, so moved. Second. Second. Roll call. Haynes? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. 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 Rotundo? Yes. And Guansi? Yes. Apologies for that. Ms. Kent has notes on the old agenda for me and then the late files on the new agenda. So she's, she's got my back most of the time. Uh, Ms. Kent? Be it obtained by the City Council of the City of Beverly as follows. In the year 2021, an ordinance amending an ordinance relative to Chapter 270, parking prohibited during certain hours, last amended 12-18-2017 by Order Number 524A, amending Section 270-43 as follows. No person shall park a vehicle in the following location between the hours and on the days indicated. Rantoul Street West at approximately 112 Dash 114 Rantoul Street, 23 feet and 8 inches south from driveway loading zone, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. all days. And this will be going in the newspaper, so this is the first reading. So please refer that to the Committee on Legal Affairs. Now, I'm going to go back to the old agenda because we're done with the late file. And we'll say again, communications, applications, and petitions. Order number 79, application for new fortune tellers license for Laura Nestor of um, the Salem Witch Supply. And I believe she was invited by Christine Dixon. I'm not sure if she's here or not. Um, I do not, uh, what is her name? Laura Nestor. Yep. I do not see her, so should we, um, just refer this to the Committee on Legal Affairs for our next meeting? Uh, sure. It's not, an, it's not a reappointment, correct? Correct. It's an, All right. So yeah. refer that to the Committee on Legal Affairs. Okay. Order number 80. Your city council is enclosed in the application from Anwa Katabat for Woodland at Court Lawrence Mass for an ice cream truck vending permit. City Council approval is needed to complete the process for licensing. No license shall be issued until we have all the necessary paperwork. Uh, this has been has this been signed off by the police department? It has. He, it has. he was also invited. Um, Christine may know more than I do about this. Ms. Dixon, yeah, I, I did um, send them both the information for the meetings, so I'm not sure. But this one was signed off by um, the chief and is all ready to go. And he, he was licensed previously, just not in 2020 because of the pandemic, but he had licenses before. So it's not technically a renewal, but he has been licensed before. I mean, I would ask what the will of the council is. I'm comfortable approving it, but if somebody is not, we can uh, put it off till next our next meeting. Thoughts? I'll go to you, Council Houseman now. Council Rotundo is that. Oh, yeah, Council, 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 Council President, I did ask the Chief just on certain things about Corey and Sorry checks to make sure they were done, especially with the ice cream trucks, and he did say that they were done. So I'm satisfied with it, especially where it is technically a renewal, even though last year was the pandemic. So that's just my thought on it. Okay. Council President, I, I, I would concur with uh, Council Rotundo on this. Okay. Um, I would entertain a motion to approve the license. So move. move. Second. And a roll call. James? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Husband? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Glossy? Yes. Ms. Kent, order number 81. Your Honorable City Council enclosed an application for Ellen Wilson of Six Sawyer Road for our Hawkers and Pedals license. license. Ms. Wilson was previously licensed as well in 2019, so it's technically a renewal. 
Okay, so if we follow suit, then um, I would entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Second. In a roll call? Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Houseman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Yeah. Rotendo? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Order number 82. This is a list of establishments who have returned paperwork to renew their secondhand dealers' licenses for 2021. They did have council approval last year in 2020. It's just renewals for each of them. Okay. I would entertain a motion to approve the licenses. So moved. Second. And a roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Postman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guanci? Yes, and if you happen to look through them, they are long-standing businesses here in the city of Beverly. Uh, let's go to order number 83. And this is a list of establishments who have returned paperwork to renew their petroleum storage registrations for 2021. All renewals. Um, and they're what, Ms. Kent? All renewals. All renewals. So I would entertain a motion to approve the renewals. So moved. So move. Second. And a roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Houseman? Yes. Yes. Rotondo? Yes. And Guanci? Yes. Um, no one finished business. Let's go to motions and orders, please. Order number 78, um, be it obtained by the City Council of the City of Beverly as follows in the year 2021, an ordinance amending an ordinance relative to Chapter 270, Vehicles and Traffic, Section 270-49. Off street parking, handicapped parking, amended section 270 49 as follows. Add a handicapped sign to be placed at 39 Front Street. And this is, it has been in the newspaper, and the final passage will be Monday, May 3rd at our meeting for you to approve. Okay. So, do we need to take action on this and vote or no? Not till May 3rd. Not till May 3rd. We'll have final passage. Council Rand will get her handicapped parking sign in front of 39 Front Street. Thank you for your work on this, Council Rand. Uh, let's go to reports from committees. Order number 74, communication from the Beverly Preservation Committee, eighth round CPC project funding recommendation. Set the public hearing. Right, I would entertain a motion to set that public hearing for Monday, May 3rd at 7.30. So moved. Second. Ames. And a roll call. Sorry, Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Houseman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guanci? Yes. Uh, Ms. Kent is rushing because we had a bet tonight that we would, she said <laughs> the under was 8.30 and I said, no way, we're going over. He's so full of it. Continue, Ms. Kent, please. Legal Affairs, order number 70. Communication from the mayor for reappointments for Human Rights Committee, Paul Lenzakis, Leah Jones, Alicia Moffetti, and Chief John Lalatcher. Entertain a motion to approve the appointments. So moved. Oh. I think Councilor Ames has her hand Councilor up. Councilor Ames. Thank you, Mr. Um, President. I, um, I just, for the Human Rights Committee, I mean, I, I am in complete support of Mr. Lang Zikos, Ms. Jones, Ms. Monfret, but given the article I read in the Salem News about the chief's tweet um, regarding domestic violence um, protection, I just have to say that I feel like people on the Human Rights Committee have to be some of the most empathic people in our community. And I am just concerned. I'm not saying that there should not be a police officer on the Human Rights Committee. I think that is just fine, but I think I'm, I'm a little disappointed with the mayor or whoever suggested this appointment right at this time until this 
um, issue is cleared up. So I just, I just had to say this um, to us tonight as we move forward with this. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Ames. So would you like us to take the appointments as uh, separate? I would be extremely appreciative of that, Mr. President. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Kent, can you, I don't have the list in front of me. Could we do them one at a time? Sure. Um, reappointment for Paul Lanzikos. Yeah, uh, I would entertain a motion to approve that appointment. So moved. Second. Ames? Roll call. Sorry. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Houseman, yes. Houseman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. Inguansi? Yes. Next, Ms. Kent? Reappointment for Leah Jones for the Human Rights Committee. Roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Houseman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Matungo? Yes. And Guansi? Yes. Ms. Kent? Reappointment for Alicia Monfet? Roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Houseman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guansi? Yes. Appointment for Chief John Lelatcher? Roll call. Ames? No. Council Mr. President, President. There are, Council President, there are a number of uh, folks, uh, councillors texting who would like to be heard on this. Oh, there you are. Sure. Thank you, Councillor um, Houseman. Council Flowers? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I was, I was curious to know, I, I'm not sure from a process perspective this can happen, um, but given Councillor Ames is raising the question, um, just given the circumstances sort of about this, this particular tweet in this case, but I'm wondering if there's a possibility that rather than vote yes or no on this particular reappointment tonight, if we might be able to, um, as a council, send back to the mayor and the chief. I hear Councillor Ames saying potentially there's space and may make sense in our community also just given the work that we're doing together and with our police um, for some of these appointments to be rotating in any case and there may be other officers perhaps too who have been very invested in this work um, who may be interested in also taking a turn on this human rights committee and I wonder if process wise it, it would be allowable for us to invite the mayor and the chief potentially to talk more about that that idea rather than us voting yes or no tonight on this particular appointment that's okay you have council Flaw, a, you have that right to hold that until next meeting um, okay would it be do i need to do that right now or can i hear the other counselors i mean you can hear anybody you want but we'll go to okay. council Rand. as long as one of you make a motion to hold that that's fine okay thank you Thank you. I actually was going to make a similar suggestion and in inquiry as Councillor Flowers. And I might just add that um, uh, through my work with the Human Rights Committee and directly with the Chief, we have discussed the potential of another representative from the police department serving on the Human Rights Committee, sort of even just for the like for the benefit of having kind of like sharing the experience and building that experience as a experience of serving on the human rights committee with a different um, member from the police department. So I, I would agree with the idea to hold it and maybe have a conversation with the mayor and the chief and um, rather than voting it up or down tonight. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Council Flaherty. Yeah, I definitely think we should hear from the chief. I don't think it's right that we sit there and say no without informing him of why he's not on the committee. We don't do that to anybody else. So I think we should at least give an opportunity to kind of be heard and see what the mayor has to say. 
um, and get some facts out there than than worrying about uh, you know newspaper articles and you know that we, we have a pretty good chief and I think we should need to kind of and he's done a lot for the human rights committee um, and for the community so I think we uh, I think we owe it to him to have him speak on his on his behalf. Thank you, Council. I already agreed, and we can do that at our meeting on the third. Um, Councilor Copeland. Uh, yes, thank you. And I was going to say when my time came up, I don't know if this would have been right or not, but that I, I didn't know enough about the issue to have an informed, um, you know, yay or nay in regards to it. Um, so it wouldn't have been possible for me to, to render a vote either way at this point, because I just don't know enough about uh, the issue altogether in order to do that. Um, so if we could do as uh, council, Councilor uh, Flowers said, um, you know, have a deeper conversation and, and maybe reschedule something else, that would be perfect. Thank you, Councilor Copeland. So we will hold that. Thank you all. Are we going to hold the whole order? I uh, know. We'll just hold that appointment. Okay. One, two. Please. Order 68, communications and reappointments for Beverly Culture Council, Brenda Wong, Wong, Wong Murphy, Rion Manita, and Allison McCarthy. McCarthy. Uh, motion to approve the appointments. So moved. Second. And a roll call. Ames. Yes. Copeland. Yes. Flaherty. Yes. Flower. Yes. Houseman. Yes. Rand. Yes. Rotundo. Yes. And Guanci. Yes. Order number sixty-nine: appointment for the Beverly Culture Council, Jennifer Dawson. Michael Iapona, Diane, Diane Keller, Fernandez, and Lindsay Smythe. Smith. I don't know. Ms. Keller and Ms. Smythe were here. Um, Ms. Smythe is still here. So let's. Uh, and Ms. Keller is here. Um, seeing that you're here, um, ladies, would you like to make a comment before we approve your um, appointments? Sure. I'm looking forward to serving on the Cultural Council again. I served in 2003, actually 2005 to 2008, and it was a great experience. And um, we're off to a good start already this year. So I'm looking forward to serving the community in this way. And I'll answer any questions if there are any. Thank you. Lindsay, great to have you back. It's nice to be back. Thank really. you. I'm glad I'm still here to approve your appointment. <laughs> Thank you. you can come by next year. Um, Ms. Keller. Yep. Hi, um, my name is Diana Keller Fernandez, and I've lived in Beverly for about 25 years. And I'm looking forward to uh, serving on the Cultural Council and uh, bringing more arts to Beverly. Thank you. Uh, it's great that you hung on just to introduce yourselves and <laughs> say a few words. That means so much to us. Um, Councilor Ames has a question or has a comment. I just have to say that this is great. And especially to see um, Ms. Keller here, a fellow <laughs> Eaton alum. <laughs> Welcome to city government. Thank you, Stacy. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? I'd entertain a motion to approve the appointments, Ms. Kent. So moved. Second. Second. Roll call. Put your microphone on, Ms. Kent. Please? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. <laughs> Flowers? Yes. Houseman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guanci? Yes. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Ms. Kent? Well done. Is that all we have? Great. Um, uh, we have a special city council meeting next Monday night, the 26th of April, that will do, it's a joint city council meeting with the CPC, the Community Preservation Committee, uh, and it was requested by the mayor. He'd like to talk about some projects that the CPC uh, may help fund. Uh, then we have our regular city council meeting on May 3rd. Does anybody have anything else to add before uh, I entertain a motion to adjourn? Council Copeland. Yes, thank you, Council President. And uh, thank you, Councilors. And I just wanted to say this with the, um, the verdict of the uh, Derek Chauvin case. 
I know it's been a, a lightning rod and, and helped to, um, you know, spark many things and uh, lead to even me being in this role in part. And I just wanted to say, um, I hope that we as a city uh, of Beverly, its government, city officials, uh, police force and its citizens, hopefully we can see this as a step forward and an indictment, not on the police force as a whole, uh, but for an individual in the role that did something wrong and was held accountable. Uh, because I think that's all we want at the end of the day was for, you know, if you do something wrong, you're held accountable for the wrong things that you do without it being, you know, it's the police force as a whole, where it's, you know, uh, even George Floyd as an individual, but, you know, an act that shouldn't have been committed was committed and it was held accountable and due process was followed. And I think hopefully that's a great step forward and what we're looking for social justice and, you know, the growth and development of our community uh, here in Beverly, but also as a nation. And Thank you, so Councilor Copeland. Well said. Um, on that note, I would entertain a motion to adjourn at 8.30. It's a push. So moved. Second. And roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Houseman? Yes. Randy? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guantsi. And yes. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll see you next Monday. Appreciate you all being here. Good night. Good night. Great work. Good night.